you might remember the story of John Allen Chow. He was a an American missionary, young guy, from the Pacific Northwest, actually, in our neck of the woods, near Portland. And he sensed a calling uh, to bring the news about Jesus to people who hadn't heard it before. And, and so for a number of years, he, he prepared for this. And in 2018, a group of local fishermen kind of brought him to the North Sentinel Island, close to India. And the people of that island had basically no contact with the outside world. Actually, India had forbidden contact. It was against the law to, to try to make any contact with them. Any encounters historically had been incredibly violent and, and hostile. Uh, but John Chow said, no, it's, it's, it's uh, worth it to lay down my life, to potentially die, to bring people the news uh, about Jesus. Uh, on his first encounter, he kind of left some gifts and then paddled away as they started stringing their bow and arrows at him. Uh, the second time, he actually got onto the beach and he was trying to explain to them about Jesus and this little boy uh, shot an arrow right at him and it actually hit John Chow's Bible. And interestingly, it, it hit his Bible as it was open to the page with Isaiah 65 verse 1 on it, which says, I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. To a nation that did not call on my name, I said, here am I, here am I. Interesting. Uh, on that second encounter, the islanders kind of took everything that, that he owned, and so he swam uh, back to his, his other boat that was kind of offshore, and he wrote in his journal, I believe it was that night, he wrote that he knew that the following day he might very well die. Uh, but he was willing to do this for the sake of Jesus. And so the next day, those fishermen uh, from a distance passed by and saw the islanders burying a body that bore the resemblance of John Chow. And the news of his death became a kind of a viral, a viral story. Everybody was talking about it, and mostly it was one of, of outrage. Um, there were Christians, lots of Christians, who questioned his motives and his techniques in, in going to that island, the reaction from those outside the, the Christian world were a little bit less kind. People said that what he did was, was a horrible thing, that in fact, John Chow was the attempted murderer because he might have brought germs and diseases to this people that they wouldn't have had immunity to. What those people maybe didn't know is that John Chow had actually vaccinated himself and quarantined himself exactly for that reason before going. His family uh, instantly kind of issued a, a, a statement of forgiveness for their son's uh, death. And, uh, and people said, no, 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 you're not the ones who need to be forgiving. They need to be forgiving you and they need to be forgiving your son because it, it, is, it was a far worse crime in people's eyes for him to impose his beliefs than his murder. And I want to put impose in quotation marks because I'm not sure how a solitary unarmed stranger was going to impose much of anything on a group of people. But anyways, that to them, was, to people, was a far greater crime. Ed Stetzer, he, uh, he wrote an article for the Washington Post afterwards, and, and he made a comparison that others made too. Uh, he talked about the story of Jim Elliott, and, and a team of, of missionaries who in the 1950s had made contact with the Huarani people of the Amazon. And they had gone in, and their, their first few contacts were promising. And then uh, Jim Elliott and four members of his team were speared to death by some of those tribesmen. And Stetzer said this story was featured all over and prompted a missions surge. Like people were interested in missions. In fact, some of the family members of those who were killed, ended up going back to that tribe and continuing to try to build a relationship. And actually, quite a number of them came to faith in Jesus. One of uh, the, the, the killed uh, missionaries' sons actually ended up baptizing his father's killer. I mean, just incredible stories that came out of that. And, and because of their Christian faith, the Hurani people have actually made great strides even in, in their relationship with the government, their claim to the land, and and, and so on. It's actually been quite a positive thing. But Stetzer said that, that John Chow's story has seemed to prompt a missions backlash. And he said the difference is in our culture. It's, it, it's a, the change has taken place in our culture. Not so much the situation, but, but us. He said people are much more negative about missions 
partly because of mistakes that missionaries have made, such as colonialism, a lack of cultural awareness, and more. But for many critics, it is the core goal of conversion itself that they object to. See, it's, it's good to ask questions about motives and techniques and strategies and whatever else. And it's crucial that when we bear witness to people that we do it in a way that displays love and compassion that does not violate God's character, that's crucial. But, but the core goal of conversion, I got to tell you, it really doesn't matter very much what the prevailing winds of our culture say about that, we are called to share about Jesus. We are called to make his name known in the world. And that's what I really want to get across today. I'll I'll address some of those concerns, but really I, I want to make very, very clear that regardless of what people in our world think of of trying to persuade other people to follow Jesus, that this is in fact needed more than ever. It's something the church needs to engage in because Jesus is good news. And and it is meant, good news is meant to be shared. So I want to pray, and then we're going to get into some passages from Isaiah that, that get into this a little bit more. So Jesus, we ask that in this time today, that you would ignite uh, in your people a desire, a passion to tell people about you uh, and, and to even go to the nations to do this, Lord. I pray that you would, that you would spark something in us. And I, I pray, Lord, for those who do not yet know you, that, that they would hear your voice today and that they would know, Jesus, that what you have done is good news. And I thank you for the opportunity they have to hear it today. In Jesus' name, amen. Um. So let, let's start with God's own heart, his own desire. And we, we see this, his desire to be known to the world all over Isaiah. But one example from the passages we've looked at in this series is Isaiah 45 verse 22, where God says, Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. That right there is the foundation and the basis of, for, for mission, uh, for, for sharing the good news. Because there is one God. There are not many. There is one. And as the one true God, he alone has the power to deliver us from the greatest of enemies that all of us humans share across the board. Sin and death and evil. He alone can defeat those. And as our creator, as the one who made us, he knows us best. And relationship with him is crucial to understand why we are made. A relationship with him is crucial to experience life as it is meant to be lived. And so, so it is good. It is fundamentally, and, and again, we'll, we'll give some caveats to this in terms of how we do it, but it is fundamentally a good thing to let people know how God has delivered us, how he has reconciled us, how he has brought us into relationship with him. And the good news here is that God wants this. He's not hesitant. He's not reluctant about this. He wants people to know. He says, turn to me and be saved. This is what he wants. And we see that really clearly in this really incredible passage from Isaiah 56, which uh, Abby will read for us. Let no foreigner who has bound himself to the Lord say the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. And let no eunuch complain, I am only a dry tree. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to serve him, to love the name of the Lord, and to worship him, all who keeps sab- Sabbath without dis- disagreeing it, and who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain, and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offering and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called the the house of a house of prayer for all nations. The Savarai, the Savarai Lord declares, he who gathers 
the exile of Israel, I will gather still others to them besides those already gathered. So a couple things from this passage. The first is that membership in God's people is not exclusive based on ethnicity or race or nationality or any of those things that we're kind of just born into that we have no say in the, ma- in, in the matter. I mean, those things cannot stand in the way of full acceptance into God's people. And this was, this was um, countercultural in Isaiah's day to, to say this. Uh, and it's been countercultural. It's, it's, been, it's been a challenge for various peoples through, throughout history. I mean, we don't need to think further that back than, uh, than, than segregated United States, where if you had black skin, you weren't allowed to drink from the same water fountains, go to the same schools, go to the same churches, eat at the same restaurants, sit in the same section of the bus, play in the same sports leagues, and so on. This evil, evil system of dividing people and keeping people uh, apart from full involvement in society because of the color of their skin. And of course, we as Canadians are, are not, we're not innocent in the matter here. Uh, of numerous examples, you could think of World War II and the internment of 90% of Japanese Canadians, not because of who they were, not because of how they lived or the character, simply because of where they were from. And that gets a little bit at the, at the segregation even that existed in ancient Israel. I mean, you, you might know, and I've, I've said this before, but in the temple, there were kind of these, like, these areas of, of almost like concentric circles of, of holiness where on the very outside kind of court of the, of the temple, the Gentiles, the non-Jews could come. And then it was an area for Jewish women and then Jewish men and priests and so on. And there was actually, in Jesus' day, there were signs on that outside wall of the temple saying that any Gentile who went beyond that point, their death was on their own heads. They were, they were responsible for their own death. But God says here in Isaiah 56, this is not to be the case. He says, let no foreigner who is bound to the Lord say that they're excluded from God's people. God says, it doesn't matter what you've heard or what you've understood. It is a lie. I, as God, am telling you that is a lie. You are not excluded from God's people. In fact, in verse 6, he talks about those foreigners who will minister to him. And that word is used of priests, as in there are going to be foreigners who do not share in Israelite descent who are going to serve as priests in God's temple. And this was so, so offensive to ancient Jewish sensibilities that the the scribe who copied Isaiah's prophecy, the copy that was in the Dead Sea Scrolls, ancient collection of of writings, the scribe who did that just omitted that verse. He's just like, I'm not even going to write that down. It's not going to be part of the Bible that I'm, that I'm copying down because I can't even, is what he would have said in modern terms. Just, just scratch it all together. But God says they're going to serve as priests. And then verse 7, he says they're, they're going to be brought into my, into my temple. He talks about the temple, my holy mountain, my house of prayer, a house of prayer for all nations. And by the way, this verse was the foundation for why Jesus went off in the temple. Remember the story about him overturning the tables, driving people out? It was because, most likely, not not only because they had set up a marketplace in the temple, that, that was an issue, but because they had done it in the court of the Gentiles. This area of the temple that was reserved for non Israelites to come and worship Israel's God, and Israel's leaders had said, no. That's not important. It's more important that we uh, make some money here and, and sell, sell some sacrificial animals. And Jesus just goes, no, that's not what this is for. And, and actually, that, that's the case from the beginning. First Kings, when Solomon consecrates the temple, inaugurates the temple, he prays. As for the foreigner who does not belong to your people Israel but has come from a distant land because of your name, when they come and pray toward this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place, 
so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you. See, this was God's intention from the beginning. It was his desire that all the nations would come to his light, come to Zion, come to the temple, and that they would know him and that they would worship him. God's people are not exclusive based on nationality, race, ethnicity, or any of that. Would have been a challenge For people in Isaiah's day, it it is a challenge still for some of us today and in some parts of the world. I suspect a little bit less controversial, though. There's a piece of this that wouldn't have been controversial in Isaiah's day that is, though, for us in, in some ways. Which is that God's people, membership in God's people, is not inclusive without condition. Here's what I mean. There, There are people who... Uh, say that all in the end will be saved. I think we all would, would love that. We all want that, I believe. But, but some people say, no, that's actually how it will happen. And those who try to base that belief on the Bible will go to passages in Isaiah in particular. Isaiah 45, which I read earlier, concludes by saying, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess but that misses the very clear language in Isaiah elsewhere. We've talked about this too, that speaks of judgment, final judgment. Uh, Passages like this that make it clear that it's not all foreigners without exception, but a particular kind of foreigner who is welcomed fully into God's people. A kind of foreigner, verse 6, who bind themselves to the Lord, who minister to him, who love his name, who are his servants, who keep his Sabbath, who hold fast to his covenant. We could break down each one of those a lot more, but the bottom line is that it boils down to relationship. It boils down to a response of faith to God and the obedience and the conformity to his character that comes out of that. That's what God is looking for. And so, you know, this this idea that that there should be no barriers, that it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how you live, it doesn't matter what you believe, that in the end everyone's just okay, and that anyone who says otherwise is judgmental and intolerant and, and hateful and so on, it just doesn't fly, biblically speaking. These things do matter, partly, largely, because God says that they do, because he actually gives us choice. There's a responsibility on us to respond to his grace and his mercy by putting our faith in him. And and again, this is sincerely, authentically what he wants. It is the heart of the Father, the Heavenly Father, that we would all come, enter into his home. The invitation is there. Will we respond. It's, it's what he wants. There's nothing that gives God as much joy as a sinner who repents and turns to him. So how do we, how do we participate in this? If this is God's desire, how, 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 do, we, how do we join in as, as he's doing this in the world? A couple of aspects to that. Here's one from Isaiah 60 verses 1 to 5. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See darkness covered the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look about you. All assemble and come to you. Your sons come from afar and your daughters are carried on the arm. Then you will look and be radiant. Your heart will throb and swell with joy. The wealth on the seas will be brought to you. To your your riches of all the nations will come. I love that. Verse 5 there. You know, your hearts will throb and swell with joy. It's what we talked about last week. Last week we talked about how joy is available to God's people, even in the midst of sorrow, that it's accessible because of who he is, because of his promises and his character. And I, I kind of sent you with this, like, encouragement to, to, 
to be people of joy because it's, it's going to shine. It's, it's going to it's gonna stand out in this world. And even, I think, in, in our own city, in our own neighborhoods, where there's so much bitterness and animosity and, and tension, that we would be people of joy in the midst of every circumstance. I, I think it's so, it's so attractive. It's so compelling. And that gets into the big picture of this text. Verse 1, arise, shine, your light has come, the glory of the Lord rises upon you. Now, what is, that, what is Isaiah referring to? What is this light? Well, in the, in the exact ver, in the verse right before this, at the end of chapter 59, it's, it's about the Holy Spirit being poured out on God's people. So this light that has come, the glory of the Lord, is the, the filling of the Holy Spirit. It is God's Spirit dwelling in us. It is the Holy Spirit producing in us things like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and goodness, faithfulness and self-control. It's the Holy Spirit making us more like Jesus. Jesus said that, that we would be the light of the world as we follow him who is the light of the world. And so as we're filled with his spirit, as we become more like him, this is a light that shines. And Isaiah says in verse 2, and, th- and this, this would have gotten him into sensitive, sensitivity training seminars today, but he says that darkness covers the earth. And Isaiah would say it's because of idolatry. It's because people are chasing after false gods that cannot satisfy, that cannot fulfill. And so there is this darkness and this hopelessness that exists on the earth. And I'll I'll say that that is the same thing today that we've talked about this. There are plenty of idols and darkness that exist because of that. And what Isaiah says is that people are going to be drawn to the light that exists in God's people, to the God's glory that shines in his people. They're going to come. They're going to flock to Zion. They're going to, the nations and, and their kings, they're going to come with all their wealth, all their riches. They're going to come because they want to be part of this. It's very similar to a, a striking passage in, in Zechariah, another prophet, who says in those days, Ten people from all languages and nations will take firm hold of one Jew by the hem of his robe and say, let us go with you because we have heard that God is with you. We've heard that God is with you. We've seen it. We want to be part of this. And and that's what actually Paul says in 1 Corinthians. He talks about a a church gathering and says if the Holy Spirit is working among you, people are going to come in, they're going to fall on their faces, and they're going to say, surely God is among you. He's, He's here. See, this was always the point. Israel was not chosen, wasn't called, wasn't given the covenant so that they could kind of look out at the rest of the world and go, ha, ha. It's not so that they could revel in their special status. They were always chosen, called, given these privileges so that the nations, the ends of the earth would hear and see. It was so that they would be a distinct people, a people that live a markedly different kind of life that would be attractive. This is what, this is what you see from the very beginning, Genesis 12. When God calls Abraham and he says, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to bless your descendants, and I'm going to make you to be a blessing to all the peoples on earth. This was always the point. This was God's strategy in calling a people, setting a people apart so that they would be a light. It's mission by magnetism. It's it's addition by attraction. And I can... I can think of a couple of recent church trends that I think misunderstand this. One is what is sometimes called the seeker-sensitive or the seeker-driven church movement. And, and the desire and the motivation here has been good, that people would come, be part of the church, become followers of Jesus. Fundamentally, really, really good desire. 
But what has happened is that these churches have misplaced the source of attraction. They've thought that people would come, that they would be attracted because of superficial means. That if we put on a really good show, that that's what will get people in. Um, I shared an article with our board just, uh, just this last week that talked about, um, lamented how some of these churches have integrated, you know, rodeo shows and wrestling shows into their Sunday mornings. Just whatever it'll take to, to get people in. Anyone want to throw down some WWE right now? No? Not? Yeah, Russ, all right. We might get to that. They lamented this. And, and other churches, a little bit less extreme perhaps, have thought that, you know, fog machines and lasers and stuff, like if we just put on a really good show, this will attract people. And, and it's just a tragic misunderstanding because that's not what's going to bring about change and transformation. That's not what's going to form disciples. You might form consumers that way, but you're not going to form disciples. What, what shapes and forms and attracts people is the Holy Spirit, the presence of God in a people. The other, the other church movement that I thought of was the what's called the missional church movement. And again, the, the, the fundamental desire here has been good to try to get people out, to tell Christians, you know, you, you, gotta, be, you gotta be building relationships with your neighbors and with your community. Stop, stop hanging out so much together and get out there. But the, the weakness in this, in this idea, in this model, is, is that in some cases there's actually been a discouragement from spending any time together as the church, a discouragement to spend much time praying together, reading the Bible together, worshiping together, because it's all about getting out. And what's happened is is that you you send people out who actually aren't any different. And and they're they're not attractive. They're, they're They're not even discipled because there's no way for them to be discipled. You've taken all of that away and just told them to go out, but they've got nothing to offer. And that's why I just, I want to say to us, as the Bridge Church, how crucial it is if we are to see the nations come to know Jesus through us. And we've always said, I mean, we've got the nations right here in greater Vancouver. I mean, the nations have, have come. But of course, the, the cool thing about COVID and, and about, about live streaming in particular is that we, we have now reached out to the nations in a way that we couldn't before. If we want to see the nations, if we want to see people come to faith in Jesus, then we must be a distinct people. We've got to be an attractive people. And that will happen when together we are growing in the filling of the Holy Spirit. It will happen as we give ourselves to corporate prayer and corporate worship and, 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 and with hunger, reading the Bible together, seeking to understand it more, and serving others together. It'll come as we commit to building one another up. Jesus said that the world would know the truth about him because of the love and the unity that exists in us. And so again, I just I want to say, Bridge Church, let, let's give ourselves to this, to being a distinct, attractive people, and that when that happens, and when people are drawn, as God says they will be, that we would welcome them with open arms, because the point is to be a blessing and to see the gospel go out. But there's another aspect to this. It's one with the missional church movement thing I, I kind of alluded to a little bit. And here I want to go to, I want to, go to physics just briefly. Uh, physics was not my strong suit at all in school. I was like an English and history guy. I was a phys ed guy. Uh, physics really didn't, didn't sit well with me. Uh, but I, I, I learned something this past week. A, a lot of what I was just talking about, you could say, amounts to centripetal force. You know, that, that force that's exerted on an object to kind of keep, to draw it in, to keep it close. Um, that, that's kind of what we've been talking about, right? Drawing people in. Now, I, I also remembered that there was this, this force called, uh, well, I'm going to pronounce it the way the Americans pronounce it. Apparently, it's cent- centrifugal. I thought it was centrifugal, but apparently that's British, so I don't know. Let's, let's go with the Brits, actually. Then it's different. Okay, so centrifugal force is that force exerted on an object to, to kind of propel it outwards. Now, what I found out this past week is that scientifically, those two forces, centripetal and centrifugal, are actually two sides of the same coin. 
They call a centrifugal force an apparent force because it's not its own thing. It's really just the same force from two different perspectives. The example that was given uh, in the article I read was a, was a merry-go-round. You remember those death traps that would send kids flying into orbit and knocking into each other like bowling balls into pins, uh, causing untold injuries. That's a thing of the past, by the way. We were at a, at a playground, a, a, more, a newer playground recently, and uh, it's just like, a, well, we're going to show a picture of it. It's like a disc with some ropes on the outside, and it's tremendously difficult to actually get moving. Like parents, you've got you to have parents with like, like a decent amount of strength, like pulling this thing around, and then you fling it with all your might, and then like three seconds later, it comes to a stop. It like, it's not dangerous at all. It requires a ridiculous amount of energy from parents, and still, kids just, that's all they want to do. Zachary wanted to be on there for like half an hour straight. I'm like, really? This is so lame. But anyways, kids don't understand playgrounds, guys. They don't really get it anymore. It used to be fun. They settle for so much less now. In any case, merry-go-rounds. Apparently, the, the example here is that uh, one type of force is being exerted from the perspective of the merry-go-round on the child, and, and, then the, and then from the child's perspective, there's the countering force exerted on the merry-go-round. It's, it's just, it's one event, it's one thing, but from two different sides. And I thought about how that's kind of like it is with mission, as, as we're talking about here, that, that you can't, you can't attract people in if you're not actually going out and making it known. I mean, if you go hide away in a cloister somewhere apart from the world, nobody even knows. Nobody can even see that you're, that you're different. You've got to go out to be able to attract in. And, and if you attract in, it's, it's for the purpose of being able to send out people who are distinct and different. It's, it's, it's in and it's out. It's both of these things. And we see that in this passage from Isaiah 66. And I, and I, because of their actions and their imaginations, I'm about to come and gather all nations and tongues, and they will come and see my glory. I will set a sign among them, and I will send some of these, of those who survive, to the nations, and Tarshish, to the Libyans and Lydians, um, famous as archers, to Tubo and Greek, and to the distant islands that have not heard. Of my fame or seen my glory, they will pro claim my glory among the nations. And they will bring all your brothers from all the nations to my holy mountains in Jerusalem as and no as an offering to the Lord on horses in chariots and wagons and on mules and camels. So Is that it? Okay. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say a huge thank you to Abby for, uh, for reading those passages for us this morning. Great job, Abby. Uh, so a couple of things from this passage. The first, and, and, and we could unpack it in, in depth, but a couple of things. One is that God says that he will set a sign among them. And there's some debate about what this sign was. Uh, was, it, it, was it to be like an event, a, a miracle of some kind? I'm with those who believe that ultimately... This is fulfilled in the cross. That the cross of Jesus is the sign that God sets in the midst of history, in the midst of humanity. A, a sign that speaks of humanity's sinfulness and guilt, but also speaks of God's incredible mercy and his grace and his ability to save. And what's crucial to me here is that those who are sent out to proclaim this sign do it in line with the sign itself. As in, our witness needs to be cross-shaped. We need to do this in the way that Jesus does it. So it's not an imposition. It's not a power move. It's not to be allied with the sword. This is not a sword-shaped mission. 
And this is why it's so tragic when the church has coupled mission, sharing the good news about Jesus with the authority of a government, with the authority of of a colonial power that has crippled the witness of the church. The witness of the church is to be cross-shaped. It is to be sacrificially giving up our pride and our status, humbly entering into another person's life or another culture or or nation, uh, getting to know them, understanding them, and sharing the good news about God's love with them, extending this invitation. That's what we see with Jesus. That's what it takes to be effective witnesses is to do it in a cross-shaped way. And when this happens, God sets this sign sends out his messengers. He sends them, it says here, to the ends of the earth. The nations mentioned here are kind of the, at the extremities of the known world at the time, but God also says, I'm going to send them to distant islands that have not heard of my fame. And here you could think, again, about all of us, right? I mean, we live here, North America, South America, Australia, perhaps, these distant islands that weren't even known by the biblical authors, and yet at some point, Someone went out. They went to the ends of the world and they made the good news about Jesus known. Any of us who are followers of Jesus owe this to someone responding to calls like this. Calls like Jesus makes in the Gospels. In in Matthew, his parting words to the disciples are that, that he is sending them because of all authority has been given to him. He's sending them to go, to go and make disciples. Of all nations. His last words in the book of Acts to his disciples are that they are going to be his witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Agree with John Chow or not, but this was the calling that he was responding to. This was his desire to bring the gospel to a place that had never heard it. Exactly what Isaiah says here in Isaiah 66. We want to be part of this as a church. We want to be a part of proclaiming the good news about God to the nations. And um, I, I sat down with a couple of women in our church yesterday who are passionate about this. They, they comprise our, our missions team that helps us as a church engage with what God is doing in the world. And I want to share a bit of that conversation with you here. Tell us one interesting thing about yourself. Joy, something big has happened to you. I'm a grandmother for the second time this week, so that's um, such a blessing, so much happiness. Well, I'll go for the historical. Um, I got involved in the missions committee after I went on a mission trip to Mexico for almost a year in Baja, California, and it it was quite the experience. It was fabulous and stressful and I learned a lot of Spanish and saw God work in amazing ways in the hospital I was working. Well, certainly in the missionaries that we support, it's been really an exciting time. So we watch Renee and Sarah in Rome just growing and growing and having such positive work happening with their ministry. Renee and Sarah were part of our church and uh, when they were going to Regent and Renee was the youth pastor and. Uh, They were just a great couple at our church and uh, they decided that Italy was the place for them in Rome and so they took a year and learned Italian and then went and they had a business plan and it all figured out and they have really gone forward and done it. And it's just so exciting to be part of that. We've, my family's been there a couple times and seen it and it's just alive and vibrant and just full of Christ centered. We see um, God's mandate for justice being worked out in places like South Africa, where Mike Sunker had a vision to help these kids who are either orphaned or virtually orphaned. Moms are on the street, so their kids are with social services. Because I I know that's close to God's heart. I think you hear a lot about the immigrants that are moving from place to place, trying to find security and safety. Missions Fest two years ago, I watched a little documentary about the transformation of a community in Greece that was dealing with the migrants just showing up on their shores. And a church that got transformed 
because an immigrant came and sat in on their Bible services and thought, I want to hear more about this God. Mm -hmm. He became a Christian, and that was the trigger for the whole church starting to open up and offer things to immigrants. I'd say prayer is a huge thing. I think we underestimate what prayer can do at a distance. We're used to praying for people and people feeling better and seeing changes in people's lives mm -hmm. here. But when it's several thousand miles away, um, we need to remember that God is is... I was, I was reminded that the word for the world in John 3.16 is cosmos. God is involved everywhere. It was really impacting to having one of our seniors, Margaret Williams, used to every morning. She had the missionary photos around her dining room table. And every morning she would come in with her coffee and pray for each one. And when her grandkids would spend the night, they had to come sit by the table and pray for each one. <laughs> And those missionaries knew every morning Margaret was sitting down praying for them. And there always are local needs. And yeah, we've had that as well. You know, why are we in South Africa? Why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? Um, when the, we have lots of needs in Vancouver, in North Vancouver, there's always going to be needs. You know, whether it's your neighbors, your family, always. But we are called to go globally. God wants us to spread the name of his son everywhere. So the people who get that passion to go out into the world, step away from their friends and family and security and walk forward in Christ's name, we have to support those people. Yeah, thank you, Joy and Catherine, for sharing some of your passion for this. And as any conversation like that will be, it's just a, a tiny snapshot of what God is doing in the world. I know I, I share often about uh, what I hear about God doing in China and just this massive revival that's taking place in what would have seemed to be the most unlikely of circumstances. I've shared about what God is doing in countries, Middle Eastern countries like Iran, and how so many hundreds of thousands of, of people are coming to faith in Jesus in, in places like that in just incredible ways. It is so exciting to see what God is doing in the world to bring the gospel to the nations and how we as a church can be part of that through prayer, through support. And, and, and I want to say, I mean, maybe even this morning as you're listening to this, God is laying something on your heart. He's giving you a vision, a passion to go out to the nations to share the good news about Jesus. And I want to say that we as a church want to be a church that supports and sends out missionaries, sends out those who are sharing about Jesus. We want to be part of that, respond to that call, be obedient to it. But of course, this going out is, is something we're all called to, and it doesn't mean going to the other side of the world. It doesn't mean going to another nation. By the way, the, the cool thing about those stories, about, about those, what God is doing in those nations, is that those people are then becoming pastors and missionaries who are going to other nations or going to their, their own nations. But we, we've got you know, missionaries coming to Canada here and, and the United States. It's not, it's, it's, it's not like a Western thing. It's, it's not... It's not a white person thing. I mean, mission, sharing the good news has from the start been everyone, every culture to every culture. So let's get, the, get away from this idea that missions equals Western Caucasian people. It's not. It's, it's a global church kind of thing. That's the beauty of it, that we see uh, the words of Isaiah coming to life in fresh ways consistently. But I was going to say, all of us are, are called to go out, but it might not be as Joy kind of alluded to, that we're to go out ourselves to, the, to, to, other, to other countries, to other places. We are called, though, to go out to make his good news known in, in much more local places, perhaps, in our neighborhoods, in our, in our families, in our workplaces, in our schools. Those are places where we are going out, going to those who do not yet know Jesus and prayerfully looking for opportunities to share the good news. It is crucial that we do this. It's crucial that we do this again to kind of sum it all up because it is God's own heart. Because it's what he wants. It's what he desires. He wants people to know him. It's crucial to do this because life, abundant life now and forever is to be found in relationship with him. 
You know, just to kind of throw this in here at the end, I think my English teachers always would say, don't, don't introduce any new information in the conclusion. They'd be very disappointed with me what I'm about to do. But there was, there was a study just like last decade that, that garnered a lot of praise that showed that, that Protestant missions have consistently resulted in, despite its bad publicity and bad press, it has consistently resulted in increased literacy, in in democratic governance, in religious liberty uh, for all, uh, for for global education, that, that, that Protestant missions have had an incredibly positive impact Generally speaking, of course, there are ugly exceptions, but has, have had a positive impact wherever it's gone. This is good. It is good to share about Jesus. It leads to the flourishing of life. And we do it, again, by being an attractive people, being filled with the Holy Spirit, and by going out, by building relationships, by serving, by prayerfully looking for those opportunities. This is our calling, to make the name of Jesus known to the nations. It's what we've been doing as a church. It's what we're called to continue to do in pandemic or out of it, with a church building or without one, in person or through social media, whoever you are. Wherever you're coming from, we are called to make the name of Jesus known as a church. It's our vision as a church to know him and to make him known. So let's get at it as a church. Let's pray and we'll sing this this final song. Jesus, we thank you that your desire was not just to be known to one group of people, to one ethnicity, to one race, to one nationality, Lord, but that your desire is that all people to the ends of the earth would know who you are and that they would come to your light, that they would be saved, be delivered, that they'd be reconciled to you. And so I pray today, God, again, for those who maybe have come and are not yet there in relationship with you, we pray that you would move in them, speak to them, bring them to your light today. And I pray for us who are your people that you would prompt in us that greater desire Lord, to share about you, to make you known in any way we can. You are so good, so great. God, be glorified in this earth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.